Hello guys, welcome back again to another amazing episode and this is the Diaspora Transition episode. We interview people who move back from the diaspora, you know, and currently living on the continent. We ask them why they decided to even leave the US, Canada and other places to come to the continent of Africa, you know, with all the stereotype out there. Why? And then, you know, we ask their life here, is it easy living in Ghana or Africa? So on this episode, we have here someone very special. They are a couple who moved back from the US to Ghana and they go by the name uh, of the wheels and uh, without further ado Dale welcome on the show and Dacia good to be here good to thank be you. here and uh, thank you for being on the show it means a lot to me I've seen your videos out there I've heard about you we've met in person too uh, at Jexo shout out to Judah and um, yeah do you mind telling the viewers you know people watching from the diaspora who have not seen you before seen your videos online before what is your story and why did you decide to come to Ghana? Uh, let's start with this, yeah. Um, well, I would say that we decided to move to Ghana because Ghana has kind of always been in my mind from a long time ago, quite a few years ago. And I convinced my husband in 2020 that we should go visit Ghana. Mm. So we made plans to visit Ghana in 2021. After our first visit, um, and we actually did a fact-finding type of visit where we didn't do any of the tourist things. We looked at homes that we would like to live in. We actually went to markets. We went to different places that a person living in Ghana would have to do in order to mm -hmm. live here. Yeah. So after maybe the third day, we decided that this is where we would want to move. And we decided in 10 years, we would move. Wow. Wait, let's go back a little bit. You decided to move back to the continent 10 years. In 10 years. In 10 years. Yes. Yeah, and years. then the first time you visited, no, let's take you back. When did you visit the first time? September 2021. One, okay. Yes. The first time. Yes. You or with him? We went, we came together. Okay. Yes. And then after three days, you decided to move to Ghana. After three days, we said we could live here mm -hmm. and we'll think about, we'll come here in 10 years. So we were thinking of planning over a 10-year period wow. to, to move over to the continent, to move to Ghana, actually, wow. eventually. Wow. However, when we went back home, we talked about it, we discussed it, and it went down from 10 years to 5. Hmm. Then, after another few weeks, it went from 5 to maybe a couple of years, and then we settled on one year. So wow. one year from almost to the date, uh, that we visited Ghana for the first time we moved um interesting yeah. interesting mm -hmm. wow Dell, right i hope the name is right yes. yeah this is this is quite interesting you wanted to move in 10 years but decided to move right after three days you visited here moved after one year right what what convincing did it take her to <laughs> well she didn't really convince me but a little more backstory mm -hmm. to what Dacia led in with and that was mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was it was time and place where Dacia who's a pharmacist back home and was managing a lot of people was getting burned out mm. work was killing her literally really and killing me because the husband <laughs> has the same sleep patterns and the same worries and stresses that the wife has mm. so killing her directly mm -hmm. it's like secondhand smoke <laughs> and this was around the time that COVID hit, so the hospitals got hit hard. Wow. And this was also around the time of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, Aubrey, a lot of racially divisive uh, political climate in America. And so these things were like the catalysts that make any American go, how long can I stay here mm. at this pace? Right? Wow. And so what typically happens in America is you stay on that hamster wheel running because your life has been set up in such a way you have no options to even get off and think about what could be your next plan. Mm -hmm. And so when she said, and she also wanted to retire early. So all of those things conspired together to have us come to Ghana her with one foot out the door, me, skeptical, zero interest in leaving Brooklyn. Mm. But um, 
I'm open-minded to things. If, if things make sense, you don't have to convince me. I'll convince myself if things <laughs> make sense. And so that's how we came here in September, September of 21, to see how it would be to kind of live here in Ghana. Mm. And like she said, day three, I said I could live here. And wow. the rest is history. And so we made a plan um, to retire here in 10 years, but then we got back on the wheel. Things were just this tough, hectic, getting crazier. And so every weekend we talked about our trip in Ghana, we reduced our 10 year plan to nine years, seven years, six years, three years. We're going next year. Wow. And that's how we got here. Wow. You spoke about a wheel a lot. So, you know, let's address that life in, you said New York, right? New York City, yeah. Let's talk about how was it like. Let's let's go down to the details. The headache. She's in the, um, is it uh, healthcare. healthcare? I know COVID made made it worse. You know, but let's put that on hold a little bit. We we'll dive into it. But what is it like? You know, living in New York, the U.S., and working nine to five or whatever job is, and the hectic and that anxiety that comes with it, and what causes that? So, um. New York City is a great place to live. And you often hear it being the best place on earth to live. And there's some truth to that, but there's some um, parts of that is not true. It's great if you're working and you make money. Hmm. It's tough to be in New York City if you're not making money. Hmm. So we worked hard. In our field, we were very good in our respective fields, basically with healthcare, I'm in finance. And so we saved that money, we spent it on things that made sense. We had a very comfortable life. Mm. Um, we grew up with um, you know, parents who weren't rich, so we worked for everything that we, we got in New York City. And, uh, but the problem in America, and it's becoming a bigger problem every year, is that especially unlike Africa, unlike Ghana, people pay for things they can't afford mm -hmm. with debt and credit. Mm. So the wheel, our channel is called Off the Wheel, but the wheel is the machine that you're kind of forced to get on at an early age. We talk about it all the time. In colleges, credit card companies will set up tables in the cafeteria of a college so that you have a credit card before you graduate. Hmm. So you're being groomed on how to live in debt and buy things that you can't afford today. And you get out of college, the first thing you want to do is get a car. You get a car lease. Hmm. Hmm. Um, then you meet a nice lady. Next thing you do is you buy the big house. Yes. Get the 30 year mortgage. And everyone buys a house that they can just barely afford. Hmm. No one ever buys a house that is under their house budget. You go to your budget and maybe a little bit more. And then you wake up one day and you look at your bank statement and you have things coming out to pay for all of the debt that you've accumulated. And you might get a raise, you might get a new job, you don't save more money, you hmm. buy bigger things, mm -hmm. you take up more debt. Mm -hmm. And then the wheel becomes faster. <laughs> and then you get kids. We don't have kids, but you get kids. And you gotta pay for college. And so you wake up and you become the kind of person that is frazzled. Um, you, you have financial anxiety. These things can affect your marriage. They definitely affect your health. That's America. Hmm. And that's to a degree New York City times 10. And so we were always a little frugal in that sense. They see more so than me. Um, we weren't like big spenders of like clothing and, and like famous clothing. And Gucci clothing. and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. We, we never did that. They see about a little thing here and there. Me, technology, I always spent a lot of technology, but we didn't mm -hmm. spend a lot of money. And so, so we had the bandwidth to just jump off the wheel for one second. At least they wow. see it did. Wow. And say, how do I want to reimagine the life we have left on this earth. Hmm. How do we want to go out? Do we want to go out like a lot of our friends, some of our family, where you're working like a dog hmm. until the very end? 
or do you want to come somewhere where your finances can give you a different kind of reimagined life mm. and also where you can do things with your skills and your expertise to make positive impact. And Africa and Ghana affords us that option to do wow. all of those things. Wow. And I would even argue it would, argue, it would, it would, it would help most black Americans do those, do those things mm -hmm. if they had the time to get off the wheel and think about it, hmm. but they don't. Wow. Now, you, you talk about how it would be possible for some people to, you know, kind of step out from the right race to really look at what's going on and to, you know, reassess their options uh, sooner we do that. But I want to talk to you about the healthcare a little bit. You know, what did you grow up doing? You know, where did you grow up? What were you doing? Where you, did you grow up in New York and then healthcare, you know, working in the healthcare and like you said, the hectic that comes with it and why you felt like in your spirit that you would, you know, be better off starting a new beginning or even coming to the continent, you know. So let's let's dive into it. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's start with how you grew up in you yes, know, yes. how you grew up and then New York and then work and the healthcare. Well I actually I was born in South America. So I was born in Guyana. So Guyana, Ghana, you know, a lot of people would Similar. use it when I would say, oh, I'm from Guyana. They would say, oh, Ghana? In Africa? I said, no, 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 I'm not from Ghana. I'm from Guyana. So as long as, for as long as I can remember, people were confusing. Guyana for Ghana. Right. Mm -hmm. But I never investigated. I hadn't investigated Ghana when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So anyway, my parents, we migrated here. I migrated with my parents and my siblings. Uh, when I was about eight years old, wow, from Guyana, and we went straight to New York. Um, I grew up in New York pretty much my entire life, and um, my parents—they're immigrants, of course. So of course, they wanted the children to be, you know, somewhat elevated from where they were. So because my parents worked, you know, very hard, they went to school here. They had businesses here. Um, they wanted for me to make sure that I got a career where mm. I would be able to, you know, sustain my own life and even help them in the future as mm. well. Mm. And it's it's weird to say this, but I chose pharmacy because I went to an open house one day. I just liked what they had to say about pharmacy, and I decided I think when I was about fourteen or fifteen that I was going to be a pharmacist. Wow! Once I decided that, that early, I'm not changing my mind. Mm -hmm. I said I, I don't care if it's hard. I don't care if I don't pass. <laughs> I'm gonna do this and also at the time pharmacists were making like a lot of money and I said oh this is a great opportunity I can make money and I can help my family they still make a lot they still make a lot of money. <laughs> but at the time you know it seemed like at that time it was less lot lot less but mm -hmm. than it is now but it was probably the quickest career that I could get where I can make a lot of money mm -hmm. and at that time it was a five-year program and then later on it changed to six and I think it's even like seven now mm -hmm. so once I became a pharmacist um, I worked in retail meaning I worked in like a I don't know what we would call it here but like a regular mom and pop type pharmacy. okay drug stores I worked in big chain stores um, after I worked in chain stores for about, I would say, 20 years, I decided I really wanted something different. Mm. I started to see the trends of people that had diabetes in the areas I was working, so I became a diabetes educator, and I decided my skills would be better in a hospital. Wow. So I was able to get into a hospital system, working as a regular pharmacist for about a year and a half, almost two years. But I still wasn't able to really use the diabetes education that I had. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, director saw something in me and decided to make me a supervisor, actually a director of pharmacy in, in the outpatient department. Mm -hmm. So I did that for about three years. And it was a bit of a rat race. <laughs> it got me burnt out. I was really trying to elevate the pharmacy to a different level. But I think it took a lot out of me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with COVID, a lot of people got, you know, work from home. They had a little bit of a breather. But for me, it was constant. Mm. You know, um, when people would say that, oh, COVID's not real. It's not. It's a myth. I was living it every day. You know, I saw the refrigerator trucks or the bodies. 
So for the record, COVID is real. COVID is real. And I would see the bodies come <laughs> out of the hospital. Mm. You know, go into the trucks because there was such an overflow mm. of, 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 you know, COVID cases. But back to, to, to my, my side of things, you know, so that was just a constant all the time. So I was just literally on that wheel for almost two years straight, no vacation, no break. You're just dealing wow. with COVID because, you know, you're in a hospital, you're there to care for people. Your staff is sick, so you have to act as staff in order to make sure that things are still moving. So mm. there was a long period where I really didn't have any type of relief. Mm. So that actually helped <laughs> into kind of fast tracking also. Wow. Us, you know, us leaving. Because, wow. Although I did love having a purpose um, in the hospital. I did enjoy you know, the role that I had, it got to be a little bit much after a while. Mm -hmm. So I decided that, you know, after we, we made our visit, mm -hmm. the decision was actually easier than... Wow, than so the awakening, I would call it, what, when did that time, you know, because you know, it's different from you getting tired and we all get tired working and then what we think of as holiday, mm -hmm. right? So we go for holidays and we come back again to the wheel and then we keep it going. But I think something changed, something triggered that, you know, with the work that you, I think something triggered that above, you know, being tired. I want to really figure out what that is for both of you. What really triggered that made you feel like, wow, I can't do this anymore because you've been doing it for years, you know, and then you still go back to it. But something happened that made you be like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Well, I don't think it's so much the work. The mm -hmm. work was part of it. But in, you have to get to the work and come back from the work too. So mm. in other words, the traveling as well was a bit of a stress for me. Because at the time, there was a lot of things going on in the U.S. with, you know, police brutality, people shooting people on the train, attacking mm. homeless, attacking others on the train. And I took the train to work. Wow. And it was a point where when I left in the morning and it was dark, I was very fearful a lot of times. Nothing had ever happened to me. But there were people that you were you were just suspicious of them. There were people. The train traffic was a lot less. A lot of people were home, not taking the train. So a lot of times I'm on a train car by myself. Wow. So there was a point where I started carrying something called pepper spray. Yes, pepper spray. Because I was afraid of what would be happening. I wouldn't have my earphones on. I would always look around. You're always conscious of being who's paranoid next to you, all the time. Who's behind you. Wow. Um, there was one um, really tragic event Dale mentioned earlier, Brianna Taylor, that mm -hmm. was, she was shot in her, her bed. Well, let's talk about that. I want him to... Right. To and that me. was a big trigger for wow. me. Because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. My husband is at home. The police shot... You know, in his looking. bed, right? Yes. They came looking for the man. Wow. He was still the wrong man, wrong door. But the woman got shot. Wow. So at... I was very fearful for a long time. Wow. It was almost an irrational fear based on where we lived, but mm -hmm. it was still something that was yeah, triggering it, it, for it me. It wasn't a uh, fear that some, th those things don't happen in New York City as much as they happen in other parts of the country. Mm. Um, but Daisy has always been super um, affected by these kinds of news events. Mm -hmm. And so even things that probably weren't going to show up on our doorstep really impacted her. Hmm. So, wow. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, police brutality a little bit. Coming from the, the U.S. We, we've, on the other hand, you know, watching from Africa, have seen what happened with George Floyd and uh, Brianna Taylor and other, other people getting shot in traffic because they, they you know, petty, petty things. Living in a country where you go through that, Let's let's go through that a, a little bit when it comes to your mental health or even you know your safety in general. How does that um, make you feel? You know, living in a country like that. So, you know, America is very different. Living in New York is like living on another planet from most places in mm. in, in America. Um, the big cities have their own vibe, culture, and demographic. Mm. They're typically um, comprised of 
you know, people from different walks of life all over the globe. When you get into middle America, it becomes less diverse, hmm. meaning less people from everywhere, more white people, and in some cases, um, less diversity makes it dangerous for non-white people. Hmm. And so there are states that I wouldn't feel comfortable driving 10 o'clock on a highway late at night hmm. because there's a chance that somewhere outside of lights and cameras, someone might pull you over for a blinker, a broken light, something, and things go left. Hmm. And there are no witnesses, and, and so that's a risk. In New York City, we didn't feel that kind of risk. But just because it wasn't at our doorstep doesn't mean it didn't affect us mentally. Hmm. When you wake up, you put on the news, you want to look at what the weather is going to be like, and then you see all the bad stuff happening to our people all across America and what wow. seems to be racially motivated. Hmm. So it wears on you. And then, you know, you might just learn how to deal with this kind of thing and move on. But if you come to a place like Ghana and mm -hmm. see what your other options are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you might say to yourself, I don't have to deal with it. So for me, the trigger was more coming here, setting foot on the soil, coming out of the airport and seeing black people, mm -hmm. going to businesses, seeing black people mm -hmm. and saying, wow, when I get pulled over by a policeman here, I just have to worry about a little donation. Mommy can cry. And then also, when you start to see, for me, the economics play the big part of how what I call our American super dollar mm. can give us a certain kind of lifestyle. Right. right. And also, when you run into like different Ghanaians who are looking to partner people have great ideas here and all they need is a little bit of capital mm -hmm. and the kind of capital that can change lives here in, in the states you know you can't do those kinds of things so so once I landed and felt the opportunities and felt the love and saw the people that was a thing that made me run towards Ghana mm -hmm. versus running away from America I like that and, I like that is it the same with you? Is it because Guyana sounded like Ghana? That's why you chose Ghana? <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely I would have to say I felt the same way when we got off the plane. Mm -hmm. I felt like I landed in Guyana. Mm. I said, wait a minute, this is almost the same. Just how people are at mm -hmm. the, you know, the entrance when you come in. Right. Just the look of the people, the feel of the sunlight, the environment. It was very similar to Guyana. So I felt very comfortable. Mm. Like the first, first time that I arrived um, at the airport. I like that. That's certainly. Well, what I would say is Aquaba. Okay, <laughs> welcome home. Now I know I know living in Ghana is you know there's a whole. I would love to go to the motherland. I love it back you know back home with my people. All the fantasies are there, right? But then living in Ghana, there's challenges here. You know, there's challenges here. You've been here for almost how long now? Four four months. Four months. Four months. Okay, four fresh, months. fresh. Yeah. fresh. <laughs> We're so fresh. <laughs> Because what I want to do is to always address the difficulties and the challenges to only uh, to also kind of give heads up to people who are trying to follow your footstep or people trying to move to the uh, to Ghana. What would you say has been some challenges you are going through or you face here or things that you wish you knew before, you know, making a move to, to Ghana? Well, I, I would not. I wouldn't have wanted to know anything. Mm. I think it's important to come here and experiencing everything yourself. Um, I, I, I think that there's value in a little bit of the struggle. If you come here and things are too easy, and you pop yourself right into a place and you, you don't feel like the real vibe of Ghana, I think you do yourself a, a disservice. And so anything that I talk about, anything that we talk about that talks about struggle, we're not complaining. You know, we're just thankful that we're here and we can navigate 
the systems. And so New York City offers that you're not going to get here. And you're not going to be able to bring your city to Ghana. You're not going to be able to get all the luxuries and, and, and things that you, you had back home. Mm -hmm. If you want that stuff, you can stay there and deal right. with the bad. Because mm -hmm. every place has good and bad. Mm -hmm. No place is 100% perfect. So Ghana is perfect in certain ways, and we love it for that. And it's not perfect in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And we're okay with that, too. Mm. So I would say to people who are coming here, um, it irks me to no end when I hear Americans come here and say, oh, Ghana doesn't have this. Or, you know, something to that effect. So just come here with no expectations. Mm. If it works for you, it's the best place to live. Mm. If you're going to come with uh, an attitude of what this place doesn't have, you'll be miserable here, and I want you to go back home. <laughs> so, but I think for reasonable people like us who know that there's no perfect place on earth, mm -hmm. and you weigh pros and cons, net, net, Ghana by far, best decision we've made as a couple. Wow. Wow. I like that. <laughs> Did you know anyone in Ghana before moving though? Um, I met a few people mm. through a Facebook group. Okay. So I had some, you know, connections. That would be a no answer. Here. We didn't know any. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no. I mean, like, it, personally. No, you didn't know any. Yeah, no. Little, I would just give an extension. No relative, nothing. No, no. no. no wow. No relatives, no one. Just other people that I met on the Facebook group that we spoke to. Um, but wow. From Ghana, so I will take it. You moved by faith, even though you've invested for the first time in 2021, uh, November, uh, September, September, September. That's it. That's it. And they packed your bags. That's it. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we I particularly uh -huh. watched a lot of YouTube channels. Okay. <laughs> okay. Too. So we, lo I learned a lot about the different areas in Ghana. I learned, um, you know. The real life in Ghana, what's available, what's not available, the, you know, what other countries are nearby, what type of food places they have. So I did a lot of research. So we came here, I came here with the knowledge of, oh, we can do this over here, we can go here. So I had a bit of a, I guess, a background okay. of where we were going. It's okay. Like I just came here. Knowing From the YouTube going. videos. YouTube was my education wow. for about a year or so. It was my education. Okay, okay. So that's how I learned a lot about. So about trying to find where to live and stuff like that. How did, how how was that? Did you had a problem finding a place to live or stuff like that? I wouldn't say I had a problem. What happened again? YouTube was really the source of me for us looking for places to to live. So a lot of YouTubers would focus, you know, go to a certain place. They would say, oh, this is a nice place. I'll look up the place. People, friends, family, when you told them, listen, I think my wife and I would move to the continent. You know, your family side, you know, your parents moved to the U.S. to give you a better life, I would say, you know, to move to the promised land. And then <laughs> one day you told them, listen, I think I would move to the continent with my husband. I'm going to Africa. What were some of the things, you know, they said to you when you, you told them that? I guess the biggest thing was why. Why? Why would you move there? Um, they didn't have anything really negative to say. Hmm. They were, I think, mirroring some of the things that they remember from Guyana. I was like, oh, they don't have water. Hmm. They don't have lights go out, you know. The roads. So I think they were mimicking what they knew and not so much what I've told them about Ghana. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't negative, I would say. Um, my sisters were very happy for us and they can't wait to come and visit. Um, my parents, I think it just took them a little bit of time to really understand and adjust to what mm -hmm. I was saying. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing negative. They didn't, they didn't do any backflips. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think they were just more sad, as sad to see me go, but I don't think that they were unhappy mm -hmm. or um, unwilling to accept that this okay. is the, my new reality. What do you think is the problem, though, when we tell our parents that we move into the continent? Because 
even Ghanaian who are living in the diaspora, when you tell your parents they're living with you that I want to go back to the continent, they have this negative mindset about home that it's not possible to make it there. It's a village. Right. Why do you want to go to a place like that? We are here in paradise already. Look at, we have a job. We go to work every day. We have what to eat. And they kind of, you know, throw that out of the window. It's not an option. Don't even consider. Why do you think that is, though? I don't know. I think they, they like you said, they thought that they brought us here for a quote-unquote better life. But what we've learned is that the rat race or that wheel is not necessarily living. So we decided that we really wanted to live every day and get up and decide what we wanted to do. I can pretty much do whatever I want. Wow. When I get up. Mm -hmm. You know, I can water my plants, I can read, I can go on the computer if I want, I can do whatever it is that makes me happy versus it having to be kind of dictated to me every day. Now, I we work for, for 25 years, so it's not like I'm 21 or 22 telling that I'm going to Ghana. I've been, you know, employed, I've been to school, I have You're degrees. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think I would be more capable of making a decision as I'm a little bit older. For me in my perspective right now. So I don't think that um, Hmm. I think we, I think as we get older, we realize what's more important, hmm. and the wheel is not really going to get us to what we really want to do as quickly as we want to get there. Hmm. You know, I like that. Cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. Let me add the same questions to you. The same question to you. Um. Well, first thing is, I don't. I didn't, and I don't care what people think of the movie. Um, I've always been a person that did my own thing. And as an entrepreneur for most of my life, you do things that other people don't do. Mm. So, um, you know, leaving a finance job on Wall Street to start your own firm, people thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Leaving our great life in Brooklyn, New York City, people will think that you're crazy. Mm. And so, what can you do? Mm. People will think what they're going to think. Everyone has to live their own life. But to the question, I think it, it's just like, uh, especially parents who immigrate here, our roles were very different. My parents were Um, ripped from Africa, mm. deposited somewhere on the East Coast in America, and that's where my slave lineage comes from, mm. North Carolina, Alabama. Mm. Dacia's parents were in Guyana, mm. and they chose to come to America mm. okay. uh, for the benefits, and they thought it would benefit their children. And so our parents had a different lens looking at America. And so we come from different places. So I can understand how immigrant parents say, after all that I've sacrificed, mm -hmm. me coming here, dealing with this American system, working like a dog, putting you through school, I can see how that's a different conversation then let's say even my parents who are like, <laughs> oh, this is your chance to escape mm -hmm. and, and go back to wow. the place of origin. So, you know, that's the thing about black people in America. We have very different stories um, and we have very different lenses that we're looking at, that we're looking through. And so, um, so our, our, our reactions that I got from my mother and she got from her parents were a little different. I like that. Now, I want to be able to address what you guys are working on on a continent, business-wise, or what you've been able to um, find here in terms of opportunities. Um, before we address that, can you tell me what you were doing on Wall Street? Because that kind of, you know, st struck my attention a little well, bit. Um, I 
worked the last time I worked on Wall Street was nineteen ninety seven. Okay. With the Lehman Brothers, and um, I had worked at a place where if you want to come in and be our client, uh, you need between five hundred thousand and a million liquid cash okay. to open an account. Oh wow! And so most of the people that I knew. I didn't know any rich people with that kind of money. Hmm. So, um, so while it was a, uh, it was it was a good career and I learned a lot. I knew that for me to do what has always been my DNA, which is use my skill sets to improve our people in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to start my own firm. So I started my own firm that I've been running since 97 where I manage investment accounts for clients. Wow. Um, primarily black people hmm. who at the time couldn't go to Wall Street and get an account open. Wow. Now, things are a little different now. Not terribly hmm. different. Mm -hmm. So, like the best Wall Street firms you couldn't go to right now because hmm. of the capital you need to open up an account there. Wow. Now you can open up an account with all these little new upstarts, Robinhood account, and there's some apps that are, a Nigerian um, financial app, FinTech app, just mm -hmm. got approved from um, the Ghana government to open up here in Ghana. Which so you tech? can get access mm -hmm. to financial markets like you could before, but you can't always get access to the smartest people to help you manage your money. Mm. That hasn't changed. And so, um, and so that, that's been my career. Yeah, so is, it, is this something that is still going on right now? Yeah, I still manage. Okay, so you, you can still do that, even right. if clients want that. Right. Okay, let's, let's put that on the screen then. Right. Do you mind sharing your information? Right right okay. So, so. Um, yeah, my, my company, um, it's primarily, interestingly enough, uh, because in finance, you can decide on the different kinds of niches that you want um, to service mm. and my niche was retirement planning so that people would have money at retirement mm. interestingly enough in america that dollar amount to retire comfortably has gotten higher and higher and higher it used to be if you save a million dollars by the time that you're retired you're probably okay mm. now that's not the case and so they keep moving the goalposts or the football net they keep moving it and so you work harder, you run harder on the wheel, you make less money. Some people need two jobs. Some people need two incomes. So now you might need a million and a half or two million. Hmm. Just if to be comfortable. Just to be comfortable. If you don't have kids sucking your money. <laughs> if you don't have a healthcare scare that drains your money. If, if, if. There's mm. always some kind of financial landmine mm -hmm. between you and retirement. And so even on our channel, in, in, in one of our uh, videos, I make the case that black Americans should update their retirement plan. In addition to saving for retirement, they should consider saving for Africa. Wow. Saving for Africa. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's deep. Okay. I'll leave the information on the screen for people who want to get through to you. Let's talk about business on the continent and opportunities down here that you've been able to see or even capitalize on. Can we dive in a little bit? What are you working on here so far? Well, let's see. Dacia is on pause for a moment. Hmm. Dacia came and said she just wants to exhale and breathe for four or six months. Yeah. And, and who knows what she might, might get into, but I've always been an entrepreneur, so it's in my DNA hmm. to look around and see where I can add value. And um, most people who come to Ghana see the different gaps and where they can fit themselves in depending on their skill set, their expertise, and the, cap the kind of capital that they can bring with them or at least muster together. And so um, the first thing for us, and we talked about it before, is that we understand the importance of the American super dollar here hmm. in Ghana. Hmm. Money that an American might not think much of 
can change lives here, can fund a business. And so we said, wow, you know, when we go out, we spend money here at the little store, we're buying bread, we're buying eggs. We're a new customer, but that vendor is now servicing. So now they got to buy more stuff mm -hmm. and they make profit margin off of us. Mm -hmm. We said, well, what would it be like if there were a hundred families like us going to that vendor? That would change that vendor's life. Yes. She got to get four more locations now. Mm -hmm. What if there were a thousand families like us? What if there were 10,000 families like us mm. spending our money happily? Mm. What if those families also said, let's come together and invest our money in little things and big things? You know, we often hear, I'm sure you hear about all of the things that Ghana doesn't have, and if it did have, it would have a better place on the world export markets. You know, we talk about cocoa going out as a commodity, coming back in as a high profit margin piece of chocolate from certain other nations mm -hmm. with the cocoa because Ghana doesn't have a manufacturing um, system or network. So I think that black Americans coming here can do good things mm -hmm. individually. We can do incredible things together, whether it's investing in someone's um, little corner grocery store mm -hmm. or collectively coming together and building a manufacturing plant. So we want to bring 10,000 black American families who are on the same frequency mm. as us mm. because we all come for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to just sit here on my balcony and look at Daisy all day <laughs> and do the plants and, and make me breakfast and we go, this is good living. But we have a bigger responsibility, mm. I feel. Mm. We have capital, we have know-how, we have friends. Um, I'll just give you one little quick example. Mm -hmm. we, we first saw you at an expat event. Yes. Do you remember? Yes, Jexo. Do you remember that young man who stood up and what he said about Americans or other people, foreigners coming here mm -hmm. and only investing in the crop mm -hmm. and we never go to the other place yes. and other people come mm -hmm. and they go to the other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That touched our soul. Mm -hmm. And we were put in a position the next day where we heard about what farmers uh, passed votes on who had a lot of access to land but only had the capital to plant on a little piece Few. of it. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay. We had a discussion with the son of the owner of the farm. We walked through the numbers and we're gonna be investing in a 10 acre yam crop. Wow. Am I doing it because I wanna be in farming? <laughs> no, but we're doing it as guinea pigs mm. because if we invest in 10 acres of yam, and when they harvest it eight months from now and sell it in the market, mm -hmm. and it returns a reasonable profit for us to keep doing it again. Because if you don't make profit, it's a hobby. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. need to be sustainable, you need to make profit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a lot of profit, but enough to get other people interested. Mm -hmm. And after us as guinea pigs, if we do it and it returns a profit, we'll ask a hundred of our friends to do, the same. do their own 10 acre yam farm. I like that. And so, those are the kind of opportunities that we're interested in, mm -hmm. where money that we can put up and invest in something can make impact. And then we can show and tell, we can demonstrate that visually, because sometimes people need to see you do it first. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about what you can do, what you should do. You can talk about what you did. And so we're excited about being young farmers potentially. I like that. <laughs> you now became farmers for me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your YouTube channel and how did it come about of the wheel? Well, he always says it's my idea. <laughs> I don't even remember it being my idea. Uh -huh. um, I felt that um, we just wanted to share our story and the reasons why we were coming to um, the continent. And I said, oh, I watch a lot of YouTube. Mm -hmm. I watch everybody on YouTube. I said, oh, we can just make a channel, give information. 
because you know it's hard to text everybody what you're doing right instagram people whatsapp people mm -hmm. oh i'm doing this because everybody's interested right in what you're doing every day what are you seeing so we wanted to give you know one way that everyone whoever is interested in what we were doing they can actually you know okay see our lives here in in ghana wow okay. i think you guys are doing a great job with that i've seen you i think i saw your videos before yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I saw your video before we met that day oh, at Jexel. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So when I saw you, I'm like, you look familiar, but I couldn't recall yeah, yeah. exactly where I know you from. Oh. But I saw your videos before we met in person. Okay. So you guys are doing great. Okay. Uh, let's dive into um, people wanting to, you know, you said you want to bring 10,000 people to the continent. And I know so many people want to follow your footsteps. I know that for a fact because I have people reaching out to me all the time that I want to be able to move, how can I move? And I'm not an expert when it comes to stuff like that. I've not done that bold step, you have. So um, people are watching right now, they would like you to kind of help, advise, whatever it could be to, to make that move, you know. Would you be down to do that? And if so, what is the way forward? So, um, one of the biggest contributors to the financial anxiety of the deal in America mm -hmm. is housing. Housing in America is becoming day by day, each day, more and more unaffordable. The rent that we paid in New York City was ridiculous. If you owned a home from a long time ago, you got lucky. Maybe you're almost paying off your mortgage, maybe you paid off your mortgage. We used to live in a brownstone in Brooklyn that we can't even afford to go back and buy right now hmm. because the prices have, have, have just skyrocketed. And I say all of that to say is for people who are watching, if you can eliminate your housing expense, the rest of your life gets much easier. Hmm. And in Ghana, there is something for every budget. If if you got 30,000 US, there's something for you. If you got 50,000, there's something plus one. Hmm. If you want to, if, if you want to um, pick the most expensive district, county, city, town in your state, um, east side, north side, where the homes are in the millions, if you got millions to spend, Ghana has something for you to buy too. Mm. There's every place that you can get in on the housing spectrum. So when I say it makes most sense, depending on your budget, come here, get your house. In Ghana, there is a developing mortgage industry. So you're not gonna get a 30 year mortgage at rates that you wanna pay with conditions that you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So you're basically paying cash. Mm. So whatever your budget is, come in, secure your housing, and then figure out how to pay the rest of your expenses. In, in America, housing becomes a big chunk of your expenses that you have to run on that wheel really fast. So that's the most important thing. Find your place to live, and your budget will dictate um, you know, what things you can consider but once you come here and buy your place, living becomes easier. I like that. I like that. I, um, I just wanted to add, you know, just from the healthcare point of view, you know, a lot of people in the U.S., they, you know, they're on multiple medications, like, you know, elderly people, not even you know, necessarily over 65, but you have people in their 40s that have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol medications. And I think some of the anxiety is, am I going to be able to get these medications in Ghana, am I going to have doctors that are going to be able to treat me in Ghana? So one of the things I'm doing, even though I'm taking a pause, is really trying to get, you know, an understanding of the healthcare system here and what's available. If, you know, an American comes over, can I go to, you know, I've met, I've gone to a couple of places that I've seen that I think people would feel comfortable going. And they have specialists. There's mm -hmm. everything here, but, you know, everything costs money. So part of what I'm doing is really trying to, you know, go to pharmacies, interview pharmacists, find out what medications are here, what is the cost of medications, because for the, for as far as I know, you can't use your insurance here mm -hmm. in Ghana. 
and you would have to come here and pay cash. So people have to know that if they come here, it's probably going to be cash when they get their medications. Hospital, you have to pay cash a lot of times before you're even treated. Mm -hmm. So you have to make people know like this is the system here. So part of that challenge for me is getting that knowledge base and that information gathered so I can say to someone, okay, you have health issues. Maybe it not, might not be for you based on what you spend on medication or what your medical needs are. And somebody else it might say, okay, all of your medication is here. It's available. The specialists you need are here. So I think we have to have an honest conversation, too, about giving the right information hmm. about health care for people who probably do need some like serious I like that. assistance. I like that. But in general, though, how are you adapting? Because New York is a highly uh, developed um, place. And then you come into Ghana where infrastructure are not so good. Don't you get frustrated sometimes? I really want to know, like, because you guys are very comfortable, you know, from what I, 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 I hear from you so far. But I want to be able to get, you know, what is the challenges that, you know, really, I know that it's, there's negative everywhere. So as positive. But what would have been something that has really kind of been net wracking for you? So, I want. I want the the, the well, negative. Well, well, look, I, actually, it's, it's interesting because our next video is we're going to be making a plea to the government mm. to um, take into consideration some coming from love with friendly intentions, some advice on how to think, how to make things better for people coming in. You know, we created the commercial the year we turned, and. Um, we we uh we created the commercial year of return and um people are coming people are showing them at the door the government said come back mm -hmm. home and people said okay they booked flights they hopped on a plane they showed up but the processes and protocols haven't been really matching the commercial to come home and so with americans are ready to come here to fill out applications to do this or that, get proper documented. Those things are challenging to say the least. And so it's unnecessary what we had to go through to get our residency permit, um, to get our data card, um, to open up a bank account. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for improvement so it also just depends on the kind of person you are there are people who will complain about anything and everything we're not those people we know that you know america had a head start for reasons this is not a political show we're not going to get into the reasons where other countries were stunted for reasons and so you can't come here and expect the same level of anything so you work with what you have and if you have an idea, be innovative, create the solution. Mm. I would rather, whenever someone gives me a problem, I say, I hear your problem. Now, what's your solution? Mm -hmm. If you don't have a solution, I don't want to hear you complain. Mm. I'll even take a bad solution over no solution. <laughs> but to hear people just, well, this place doesn't have that. All right, we'll make it happen. Fix it. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to fix it, deal with it and let's move on. So for us, you know, we, we, we um we have horror stories of, of what we had to do to get all of our paper. We got it all, so it's fine. So so Ghana has some improvements to make around processes and protocols for people who want to come in mm -hmm. and do good things. I, I like the fact that you guys are very optimistic about Africa and Ghana. Okay. You know, yeah. But the African youth and the Africans living on the continents sometimes think they are better off going to the U.S. than being here in Ghana. You know, do you think it's possible to make it here in Ghana? Though? Absolutely. So if you do have an advice for the African youth, what would that advice be? I would say, so the internet has leveled the playing field. I'm going to give you an example of I'm going to beat up the African youth for one minute mm. so that we can create an opportunity for the African youth. Okay. 
So um, we all, um, as entrepreneurs and professionals, we look for other entrepreneurs and service professionals to provide products for us. So right now, if me and you started a company mm -hmm. and we want to come up with a logo, you know, we go to a logo specialist and there are platforms that are set up to provide services and products. Let's just take one that most people know, Fiverr. Right, so mm -hmm. you go to Fiverr, and if you need help with your YouTube stuff, someone can help you. Right. If you need stuff, uh, help with your IG or your Facebook marketing, someone can help you. Mm -hmm. I use Fiverr and other platforms a lot for expertise. Whenever I go, all the people I see, Pakistan, mm -hmm. Indian, Indian, Ireland, Brazil, I see no people from Africa. Mm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Do we not know about mm. the opportunities that these platforms, if you got a skill or a service, can open you up to the world? Mm -hmm. I, I, I tried to do to see. I tried to see if Fiverr had a filter where I could pick a country. It doesn't, because mm -hmm. I'm looking for Africans to pay money for services, but they're not represented on these platforms. And so, to the youth, I will say. Open yourself up to how the internet makes the level playing field for the globe and where someone in another country can retain you mm -hmm. if you demonstrate that you can do something or perform something. Um, Dacia has a health app for black people, the black people in America with chronic disease. Mm. I was a project manager to oversee the creation of that app. Mm. This was way before Africa was even on our mind, before mm -hmm. we thought about coming to Ghana. I hired app developers from Australia, from Vietnam, from India. I come here and learn that Ghana is full of super talented app developers. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that then. Mm -hmm. I wish I had known that. So. I don't know if I have the bandwidth to do it. Maybe this is your next venture. Mm -hmm. If not me or you, someone is going to create the conduit to tap into all of these young African developers, hungry, hungry Ghanaian developers, who could get work tomorrow mm -hmm. working on someone's app in the UK, in Australia, in America. Mm -hmm. The opportunities are there. We just have to find a way to mm -hmm. let the youngsters of Ghana know that there are opportunities out. It used to be you had to go to America, and to a certain extent, maybe that's still true, but it's not entirely true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely true anymore. I like that. Do you have a message? Um, I think he said it best for both of us. <laughs> yeah, because that's one area that we did notice is about the technology mm -hmm. part of it. Because we utilize technology quite a bit and we're always doing some type of logo. And when he's searching for talent, it's usually not on the continent yeah. that's represented. So. It's very true. I think when I moved back from India 2017, the internet was so slow that I can barely post a YouTube video. So even though I wanted to, you know, go on the internet all the time and do my work, it was technically impossible. So I had to leave the country. So there might be a lot of disadvantage to us here. Yes. That is, is, it makes it difficult for us to take advantage of that, yeah. you know, opportunities. But we are getting there. We are coming. Let me ask you, if you are given the opportunity, right, to change one thing on the continent or right here in Ghana, what would that be? Well, I think, well, Dale had said this, I don't know if this will be yeah. <laughs> stealing his answer, but I'm agreeing with it yeah. more and more, is the road mm -hmm. infrastructure. Okay. Because what we realize is that if you build a road, and a good road, a paved road, then people will not only, you know, develop that area, you will also strum businesses up, and it actually is an impetus for growth. So I think the road infrastructure should really be improved, not just paving the road, but also having you know lights mm -hmm. on the road Street and markers lights. on mm -hmm. the road and pedestrian walking. 
areas. Because for me, I don't drive that much here. Mm -hmm. I drive maybe like one or two blocks just to go to the gym and that's why <laughs> I refuse to get on the highway. Really? Because I don't want to hit anybody mm -hmm. walking. I don't want to hit anybody on a motorcycle. It's too chaotic. And I don't want to bump into a taxi or a tow <laughs> truck or anything. So I think that so so I think that one of the things that frustrates me the most is that I see pedestrians walking and they don't have any right of way. The cars just go. Mm -hmm. I'm not like that. If I see someone, I let them cross the street because I feel like they're yeah. walking, I'm in a car, I should let them go. Mm -hmm. But there's no like system where, you know, the pedestrians are crossing and people slow down. You know, yeah. once in a while you see a cho cho guy get out so his passengers can come across yeah. the street. But it shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. I think infrastructure with the roads is, is should be primary. It's for safety and it's also for commerce. It's also for growth and you know progression of the country. So that's my answer. But it's probably so she, safer. So she stole my answer. <laughs> so I used to say I would joke with my Ghanaian friends that I I would want to be a president, and I would only have one issue that I would run on it would be roads. Mm. I don't care if people are dying in the streets, if the dam is overflowing, if there's a COVID outbreak, I would only be roads, roads, roads. But since she stole my idea, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go with something else. Mm. I'm gonna say that if I could change one thing I would create I would create a new agency. And it would it would be specifically set up to work with foreigners who want to come and live, what expertise they have, the kind of money that they want to commit, that they can afford to commit, and what areas are they interested in. Mm. Kind of like a tender mm -hmm. for business opportunities. Oh, wow. Right? And because, like, Whenever we, whenever anyone comes, and that's why we're trying to create our own community. Whenever anyone comes, we all have to, like, start from scratch and, and, and build a new wheel from scratch, versus plugging into uh, a system that is is set up to to offer maximum synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And um, now I know. You know, I looked at the government's website and I know that there are areas of industry that they might get tax benefit to if you put money into certain agricultural things, mm -hmm. certain um, um, processes. But um, those are not enough things. and not, uh, Everyone's not going to be interested in those things and everyone's skill sets will be matched to those things. There's a lot of things that Ghana needs. There's a lot of people who can come and plug in. And so um, I would want to see a little more effort and capital and thought put around the agency for people who are coming with good intentions, who want to see Ghana as number one, and who have skill sets. Like, Dacia is, is a pharmacist. She doesn't talk about herself, so i got to talk for her. She's humble, mm. but she worked at the biggest hospital in New York. It had eight pharmacies, and she was the assistant director of one of the pharmacies where she managed 15 or 20 people under her. Mm. So her, the, her little department was like a big company. She, like many other people coming in with healthcare experience, could have really good input into things that um, the pharmaceutical industry should do here. Mm -hmm. And so so I would say that would be my one thing, to just really create a, a, a system that can tap into the expertise of people who really want to help. I like that. I like that. Now, people, bear in mind, have moved to the continent from the diaspora, but couldn't sustain their living and had to escape. Yes. <laughs> well, 
Well, I think he said it earlier with housing. Once you have, he, he always says it, mm -hmm. once you have your housing situated, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you have no food to eat, you can go to the market and buy a plant. And he said, we'll eat, we'll survive on rice so and If we ever got poor, bread. we would be in our place eating rice and beans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but once but, you have your But food, Hayford, I have a question yeah. for you. Sure, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> so these people who couldn't make it here, mm -hmm. if there was one thing one common denominator about them. Do you notice what the one thing that they all share? Mm -hmm. I think living above your budget. Mm. Yeah, this has been something that we all care a lot. And I think you said that in, in earlier on. You know, uh, people, and instead of buying houses, they rent it out. So you'd see someone living in a house with a swimming pool and everything. Uh, and it's rented, right? You have a goal of living in Ghana for like 10, 20 years or even settling down. And you have no plans of building. That can't really go so far. And Accra is not so cheap like we think it is when we are coming back from the diaspora thinking the dollars goes very far. It really doesn't. So it catch up with them very quickly and then realize that the money the dollars is finished so we have to go back to the wheels to get some more money to come back <laughs> so the because <laughs> i said it's a good thing we don't live in you know in like across central you know airport mm -hmm. or cantonments because we have no money because mm. every time i go into those areas i'm like oh a new restaurant yeah, or something yeah, and it, yeah. everything costs a lot more very true over there i mean it's lovely mm -hmm. but you're correct if you're living a little bit you know too much above your means your money will go faster very true i like you guys have a very beautiful place here and even the environment do you mind talking about it how did you stumble upon this place and well so this, they still looked at a lot of places before we came mm. and we entertained a lot of things one thing we didn't know about ourselves is that we both um owned homes at one point before we met each other and even when we were dating she owned a home in new jersey before she met me so whereas a lot of people who might not have owned homes can't wait to get here and mm -hmm. buy their pot and build their home, we weren't those people. Mm -hmm. So we were in an apartment in New York City because we wanted to be in an apartment. Mm -hmm. And we wanted the same experience here as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we looked at a lot of stuff from a whole bunch of developers. And it was pretty much like not knowing how Ghana was going to be still being a little paranoid with my new york set of mind i was mm -hmm. more interested about her safety if i traveled mm -hmm. away from her and so that was a big thing now in retrospect ghana is super safe mm -hmm. so that wasn't anything to really stress out over but that was a big thing that um went into where we eventually ended up living mm -hmm. and we just want to replicate to the extent that we could what we were living at in new york an apartment modern no steps mm -hmm. no stairs mm -hmm. and um decent internet <laughs> so, <laughs> i like that yeah. i like and you do have if you don't mind me putting on air you do have an airbnb Yes. Can I see that after here? Yes, we can we can talk about that. And mm -hmm. the Airbnb was um was one piece of the puzzle that we're working on, bringing mm -hmm. the people over. Mm -hmm. And so what differentiates our Airbnb is we say, look, if you want to come to Ghana, we have a very nice Airbnb, reasonable prices, you can do the tourism stuff, um, you can hire your driver and go to Cape Coast, go to safari, go to Volta, you can do all the things. Mm. But what we're most excited about is saying to people, but if you want to also come and practice living in Ghana, mm. this is a better way to do it than going to Kapinski or mm -hmm. going to Moving Pegs. Mm. You know, that's not Ghana. Live, you know, Staying in the East Lagoon. That's a holiday that's kind of guy. Ghana. <laughs> you know, that's like if you were going to New York City mm -hmm. and you go to Times Square mm -hmm. and you say, I visited New York. New York. No, mm -hmm. you didn't. You mm -hmm. visited Times Square. Right. Just like a lot of people in Ghana will say, Accra is in Ghana. Mm -hmm. No matter how far you are, yeah. out. So yeah. we're out here in Wajah. Mm -hmm. So we're like, we're 40 minutes from the city. Mm -hmm. 
But the other regions say, that's not even reality. <laughs> so it's all different perspectives, mm -hmm. but um, we just wanted to be in a place that was not too centered on mm. busyness. You know, it's, it's quiet here except for the birds. I'm sure you got some birds, some mm -hmm. crows on camera. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see the cows moving along sometimes. We'll see the goats, the roosters wake us up in the morning. Uh, so it's a mixture of casual and then city. If we want to be in the middle of the city, we could have made that choice. Mm -hmm. It would have been a, little, a smaller wheel in Ghana, mm -hmm. you know, trying mm -hmm. to pay for all of the stuff in the city. Mm -hmm. So this this works out for us here. I like that. I like that. Guys, thank you so much for talking to me. Now, we are almost at the end of the conversation. If, um, well, let me ask you this. Do you, has it been worth it for you moving, moving to Ghana? Four months into it, would you say it, it's been worth it? I would definitely say it's been worth it hmm. for mentally... Um, I think physically we've been able to, you know, monitor more what we're eating. We are seeing um, changes in our sleep habits, our sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. um, I think just in our whole well-being, it's it's been a great, um, it's been a great move. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, I think that um, you know the answer is going to be different depending on where you are in life, what you've experienced. So we were at the top of our careers in the city that everyone wants to go to. And we could see, even with that perfect picture, we could see holes in that picture. Mm. Right, far away, from far away, the picture looks beautiful. But when you get close and you respect it, you can see the little frayed end. The little... So we could see that. And we said, look, we're not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. How do we want to live however many years we have left? And where do we want to live? Um, do we want to go into some of the states in America where it might have been cheaper? But, you know, some of those residents don't want, want to see their faces. Mm -hmm. Or do we want an opportunity to check off box, 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 affordable, um, our, my uh, roots even trace back, we did a DNA review. Oh, really? And my roots trace back to Ghana. Wow. How many percent? <laughs> 98%. Wow. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you our plaques. Hers tra trace back to Cameroon. Okay. We did African ancestry. Okay. They go a little deeper on the percentages. Wow. Cameroonian. Familike. Familike Cameroon. tribe. Yeah. And mm -hmm. me, Ghana, Ashanti. Wow. And so you want to check the boxes. Where can you have good living? Mm -hmm. Where can you make good impact? Where can you get up and feel at peace mentally? Mm. You know, escape the racism. So if, and I'll say this to your viewers as we, 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 we leave. It feels like um, daily exasperation. Mm. You don't have time to think. The second that you get off the wheel, something is pulling mm. on your attention. And so I say, try to carve out a little time to ask the question that we asked ourselves. Would life be better for you in Africa? And if you think it could be, do your best to carve out a week, a week and a half. Budget to get that plane and get the hotel or our Airbnb mm. to come here, come here. Mm. Other African places, Ghana isn't the only place. Go to Kenya, go to Senegal, Sierra, you know. Go where you feel comfortable. And I would say that there's a better than 50% chance that you could do something you never thought you could do, mm. and that's leave America. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it was good. It was a great decision for us. It was our the best decision for us. But it all starts with just having the mind space to even think that it's possible. Wow. So, so there's no regrets. No. No. <laughs> if you do have, I'm happy to be here. Wow. If you do have a final message 
it could be anything to the audience what would that message be my i guess my final message is just bouncing off what dale said you know just ask yourself the question don't listen to you know media as to what they say africa is to be honest youtube it may not be the hundred percent truth all the time because even on those platforms things are like a little bit filtered but you can piece together a lot of things from youtubers like yourself from you know the others that we follow and you will find out that it's better than you thought mm -hmm. and it's possible when you thought it wasn't so i guess that would be my <laughs> i like that look people like you are the reason we're here if not for um technology and youtube you couldn't tell your story for us to watch mm -hmm. so thank so for all the grief i give youtube thank you youtube for allowing the storytellers to let us look into the window of africa the window of ghana through your lens mm. not a lens of someone who has only bad stuff to talk about mm -hmm. and um and that's what's kept us away for so long yeah I don't think you understand the brainwashing and the misteaching that mm. we undergo in America mm. through our educational system, what we're fed, what's omitted, what's transmitted on our TV channels. You like you think that you're knowledgeable because you're really good at reading the books that someone put in front of you, mm -hmm. or interpreting the show that someone put on your flat screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not the world. That's someone's point of view. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you a shout out mm -hmm. for being able to tell your story, your many stories, mm -hmm. to allow people like us to say, wow, that's what Ghana is mm -hmm. making. And I know you want to do a lot of things in different countries. Mm -hmm. You're going to help so many more people. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Thank my, you. my final message will be just, um, just know. Look at us. We're real people. We're not millionaires. We didn't know anyone in Ghana. And we came here and we made a life here in Ghana. If we can do it, you can do it. Mm. That's my message. I like that, guys. Thank you so much for, you know, having given me a great conversation and being very candid and, and being honest.